Okay, so last week we uh, had the first part of our look at the Holy Land. We were primarily, well actually exclusively in Galilee in the north. Uh, and now we follow our group's progression uh, to the southern half of the country. And the first place that we stopped along the way is Beit Shean. Uh, and it's not a place that is mentioned in the scriptures. Uh, not somewhere that I can say, oh, this is where the prophet or king, whatever, right? We, we don't have one of those connections. Uh, but as an archaeological site, as an excavated site, it's a great insight uh, into what an ancient city in the, especially the Greco-Roman area, right? The time just before Christ, uh, up and through the time after Christ. And so we're gonna take a look at that. It's actually a national park. There's about four different ways to spell it. Uh, but the town itself, lies 394 feet below sea level. We're not far from the Jordan River. The Jordan River is below sea level. Of course, the Sea of Galilee was below sea level, and the Dead Sea is much, much below sea level. We'll get there eventually. Uh, this is located where the Jezreel Valley meets the Jordan River Valley, right? We mentioned the Jezreel Valley going northwest to southeast. We were at Megiddo, which is kind of the gateway to the valley. We saw Nazareth. Uh, and now we're heading southeast through that valley. You come down the Jordan River Valley and that's where this town is. Uh, in the Gospels, they mention a number of times the, the Decapolis, the 10 cities. This was one of the 10. So while the scriptures don't have really any stories to tell about uh, Beit Shean, they do talk about Jesus sending his disciples into the Decapolis. Uh, whether they came here or to the other cities, we don't know. Uh, after a devastating earthquake in 749 AD, so that's quite a bit further in history, it lost its prominence and just became a small town. The picture on the left is there uh, best as understanding of what it looked like before the ruins, which is this model here. This would have been the city during the height of the Roman era when we've got, you can see, right, we've got a Colosseum, we, we've got an amphitheater uh, and other such things. We've got a large wall system around the city. This is what it looks like today. What do you notice in the distance? We talked about this last week when we were talking about Megiddo. Does anybody remember? A tell, right? It's not poker, one nail. A tell, that's the mound of this city going back as early as 3200 BC. Not as, not as ancient as Megiddo, but still, as, about as old as our records go, there were people living here, and so we've got layer after layer after layer. The main Greek and Roman city is below, of course, on the tell would have been uh, fortifications and all sorts of things. This one isn't very well excavated. We'll see when we get there. But you're looking down the main street through town. Here's the amphitheater built into the hillside, right? The Greeks and later the Romans were brilliant at looking at a countryside, or at a hill, uh, and saying this would be a good spot for an amphitheater. If we mat and put it in the curve, right, we don't have to excavate it, or we don't have to build as much, and it will help the sound amplify so that people on stage could be heard uh, naturally. Uh, and so this is the amphitheater. That was the stage of the amphitheater. Not much, of course, if it remains where the performers, the actors, who whatever it was used for, would have stood there. Notice again that basalt stone. I mentioned, right, the, the foundations of, uh, of the uh, synagogue in Capernaum, right? The bottom layer was that basalt stone. You saw some of the more costly limestone there, right? The white stone. Here is the basalt being used for regular walls, right? Not decorative things, uh, because of course it's much less costly. And that's ent entering into it, uh, this standing. Right, these are 2,000 year old structures, parts of it still standing, even after that horrific earthquake. Now, this city was destroyed by an earthquake and of course later excavated. The rubble and everything would have covered this for, for the last 1,300 years till they excavated it. Uh, but look at this road. Look at the road that the Romans built. 
We were in Pittsburgh yesterday, and my wife missed a turn on the GPS because, of course, it says turn right, and, 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 and it's not really a right, right, because that's the way Pittsburgh is. And we got on one of those cobblestone side streets somehow, and it was, right? Oh, it was horrific. That's like, what, 100 years old? <laughs> now, frost heaving has something to do with that, right? They don't have that weather over here. But look at this stone, or look at how well this has stood up, despite the fact that an earthquake shook this whole place and knocked a bunch of buildings down. That's not a half bad street. Notice the capitals uh, on the tops of the columns and how much decoration. This was a thriving town. This was a, a wealthy town. We talked about color last week in the ancient world, right? Somebody had a, I guess, looks to me like a, like a whale uh, upside down from our vantage point. Uh, that's as close as I can think of as what that might be. We couldn't actually get down in there. That's just the floor of their house, right? Tiled mosaic floor uh, with some sort of uh, artistic, there's a whole bunch of geometric stuff happening around it as well. Uh, very beautiful. So when you think of these ancient cities, think of them in color, right? Not in simply white uh, or gray, because that's not what they would have looked like at the time. I, I don't know about you, but I love the panorama shot on my phone. I, I take too many of those, probably, but that's what this is. This is the secondary street in front of us, that main street up at the top of the picture and the tell off to the right. One of the interesting things about this particular stop on our tour is that our guide said, okay, you know, let's all look at the map table, I'll talk about the town, and he did for about 15 minutes, and then he said, because of our schedule, we got 20 minutes. And I'm like, oh, that's not enough time. Uh, and my wife and I were the only ones that thought, that were crazy enough to say, all the way over there on the tell is where I wanna go. And so we walked the main strip, we turned right, we went around, we went up the hill, because uh, that's the view that I wanted to see. Uh, and then, of course, I shared the pictures with the whole group because most of the people didn't have those shots. This is looking at it from above, uh, the ruins that you can see from there. If you can answer this trivia, oh, it's, I wrote it on there. Shoot, I already wrote it on there. Have you seen Jesus Christ Superstar? I haven't because that's not my era. Uh, you remember Judas hanging himself, all right? The prop, the tree that he hung himself from is this one right here. It's not a real tree, it's a prop. You can see the, the, the metal that, that they used to reinforce it. They left it there. They filmed that scene where he kills himself right here. Which, <laughs> just one of those things, right? Uh, it's an odd movie, uh, but you can see the amphitheater in the background, the main strip uh, as well. When you go to the top of the tell, the top left picture is the Jezreel Valley heading up towards Megiddo. You can see the width of it, right? That's a fertile valley, an ancient trade route, lots of agriculture, a very important valley. When you turn around the other way and look southeast, you see the Jordan River Valley uh, and actually the country of Jordan in the distance. The Jordan River Valley is not that wide. I'll show you some other shots later. So from this site, you've got the Jordan River Valley this way, you've got the Jezreel Valley the other way. No wonder they built a city here. And it had strategic importance, it had economic importance for a long, long time. They haven't done much excavation works, uh, work at the top of uh, Beit Shean. Uh, I don't know if they plan to do it later, but for the most part, we're, we're just looking at the top layers. They have not gone uh, like they did at Megiddo and took a slice out so that you could see thousands of years into the past. Uh, on the top right, though, you can see excavation work is always ongoing. Uh, there, we didn't 
my wife and I didn't get a chance to go into the Roman bathhouse and see because we went up to the top of the tell. Other people did that. Uh, it was one of our trade-offs. But you can see the tents over the where they're doing the work. Uh, and there's another tent off to the left as they continue uh, to excavate and further uh, uncover this. And of course, the modern town, the actual town that still exists, is right over the hill there. Uh, and, and we drove through it on our way in. Questions about this town before we move to the next one? Again, I don't have extra stories to tell because this isn't mentioned in the scriptures in any sense. Um, as you know, most places aren't, right? Uh, we know a lot of about a few places and, and don't have much mention of most. Which brings us to a place that I know you've heard of, Bethlehem. Okay, and I've got a number of pictures about Bethlehem, but the first place we went to in Bethlehem was a shop. All right, our bus went through the checkpoint, through the wall, that barrier wall that goes all the way basically around the West Bank, uh, and it's an interesting question all about itself, right, because of all the, the violence right now in the West Bank. Uh, the people on this side of the wall uh, are limited with their travel rights. Uh, and right now, the, the families, there is a, a group of artisans that run this shop of Palestinian Christians, uh, and I have no idea what's happening with them. Of course, their shop is empty, right? Uh, when we get to the Church of the Nativity, I'll show you the spot where the giant Christmas tree normally is, but there isn't one there this year. Uh, it's all shut down. Uh, but you can imagine, uh, or you can look at uh, the kind of work that they are famous for doing there uh, in, in Bethlehem. We are six miles south of Jerusalem, so a, a day's walk, and Jesus makes that journey a number of times uh, for, uh, coming up from this direction to Jerusalem. Now there's about 25,000 people living here. Bethlehem's famous for a number of reasons, right? All the way back to it being the original, or the site of Rachel's tomb, that's Jacob's wife, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's wife, Rachel, was buried here. Uh, it was also, of course, the hometown of David. He becomes famous, King David. Uh, loose, it's translated as house of bread. I'm not sure why we, that's one of those things we can, can tend to know, but it's not really a big part of the story anyway. Uh, and of course, it's famous as the birthplace of Jesus, right? So Bethlehem, for being a small town back in the day, uh, and actually, I mean, 25,000, it's still a small town. Uh, it has a lot of biblical history in it. Uh, this particular shop is the one uh, that our guide knew the people that worked there. They said during COVID uh, they were just, just devastated because for months on end they weren't getting any, uh, hardly anyone in and, and all of their business dried up. In this town, about 75% of the people depend upon the tourists and the pilgrims in order to, for their jobs. They're, they're connected to that in one way or another. Um, and on the right bottom uh, is the, the, the piece that I bought uh, for the church. Uh, we set it out every communion Sunday uh, uh, the, of the hand-carved uh, Last Supper. Uh, I thought that was an awesome one. I went back and forth, but this one's more authentic. Uh, the other one I liked had them sitting in chairs at tables, but they didn't do that back then. They would have reclined at table uh, on some sort of cushion or something. So, what's in Bethlehem? This is the chapel of the shepherd's field. Uh, it's here because there is a cave below here, and I'll show you those pictures in a minute, uh, that was inhabited during the Roman period. Perhaps the shepherds that were visited by the angels. We don't know exactly. There were a lot of shepherds in the hills around Bethlehem, so we don't know if those shepherds stayed in this cave, uh, but they were shepherds like them staying in this cave. The Byzantines built a monastery on the site in the fourth century, and as I said just about every time last time, it was destroyed uh, in the seventh century, this time by the Persians. And the current chapel was built in 1953 by Franciscans, uh, and I don't have a vast knowledge of architectural uh, people, right, to know who is uh, important in architecture, but apparently Antonio Berluzzi is, is well known uh, for his building designs. This is what it looks like uh, on the inside. Again, it's a modern building, right, not an ancient one, but there used to be one sitting here. So what about the cave? 
That's the cave beneath it. Uh, I'm 6'1", and I had to duck a number of times to not smack my head uh, on the ceiling. Uh, we went in there, sang uh, a couple of Christmas carols, right, uh, about the shepherds and all of that. It was, it was nice. But it's just a little, uh, a little cave uh, underneath uh, here. Uh, this is a shot that shows you something more about what will help with your imagination. Those are the hills. The hills outside of Bethlehem, the hills on which for all the way back to David, all the way back to Abraham and beyond, shepherds had sheep because this is rocky ground and there's not a lot of rain, so what can you do? You can graze sheep. There's not much else you can do on these hills. Uh, and so that's, uh, a, a good example of the kind of place, the kind of area that these shepherds would have been relaxing, would have been resting during the night, uh, just keeping an eye on the sheep, right, making sure there aren't any wild animals or robbers or any such thing, and then the angels appear and the rest is history. The Church of the Nativity. I got a lot of amazing pictures in the Church of the Nativity. This is a famous site, one of the most, uh, other than the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, probably the second, those are probably the two places people want to visit when they go to the Holy Land if they're Christians. Uh, this is jointly operated by Catholic, Greek, or Orthodox, and Armenian churches. Uh, there are a lot, there's a big um, Armenian influence in the Holy Land that goes back several centuries. Uh, if you don't know about Armenia, it is a Christian, one of the first nations that, as, as a whole that converted to Christianity in the early church history, uh, and they have a big presence in the Holy Land. Uh, in 1852, the Ottoman Turks uh, issued a decree that basically froze in place a lot of the agreements uh, of sharing the sacred sites, all right? Who had control over them? Who had the right to do this? Who had the right to do that? And basically, those agreements are still in effect. The Ottoman Empire fell a long time ago, but because of it, it sort of made an easy truce, a, a kind of a peace between these monks that, may, that otherwise might be at each other's throats about who gets to, who gets to hold the service on Christmas Eve, on Christmas Eve right? Uh, in, the main, uh, in the main chapel. Somebody's going to want that privilege. So they've got this agreement uh, that, that is also in place at the Holy Sepulcher and a number of other places. It's actually the oldest Christian church in the world in continuous daily use. All right, there's good reasons for that, right? Number one, many of the early churches uh, from the first few generations don't exist anymore. They were destroyed uh, in one form or another. Some of the other places where once there were thriving Christian communities, there are no longer, uh, as in Asia Minor, many of the churches that Paul was writing to in Ephesus, uh, for example, or Philippi, uh, they're not once what they were. So this is a place where, going back a long way, and we'll show you the date in just a minute, there are, have been Christians worshiping every day and using the building every day. This square, if you flip around, is, is extended, it's a huge square. At Christmas, not this year, but at Christmas, there's a giant Christmas tree just to the right of this picture. And, a hu and there would be stalls selling you know, everything uh, for the pilgrims coming. It, it would be like Disney World at spring break, right? Jam-packed with people, very festive. It's all shut down this year. All right, the various patriarchs that, 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 that make the decisions for these groups that, that run the holy sites in Bethlehem, they said, number one, many of our Palestinian Christian brethren are in danger, but also our Palestinian Muslim neighbors are in danger, and our Israeli neighbors are in danger. We're not just, we can't celebrate this year. They're still going to hold the, the traditional services, they'll still do all the liturgy that they normally do, but, but no lights. No, no festival, festival atmosphere, all right? Bethlehem will be a shell of itself again this year. Uh, and it's not the first time it's happened, of course. War and other reasons over the centuries has, have shut that kind of thing down. Uh, but it's certainly sad to see uh, once again. 
The original basilica, and, and that's a word that you've probably heard. I didn't know if everyone was familiar with it. Uh, that would be a church of historic significance, uh, especially a church connected to a saint, the, the, the place where a saint was born, the place where the saint was martyred or something like that. The original basilica, of course, this one has a connection as being connected to the birth of Jesus. That's, that's enough. Uh, was built by Constantine the Great, very famous, right? Converts to Christianity, uh, doesn't make Christianity the official religion of the empire, but makes it legal, uh, so no longer persecuted. Uh, just before his rise to power was one of the worst eras, the worst era of Christian persecution in the early church uh, under Diocletian, so this was a huge change, right? In one generation, basically, generation and a half, the church went from being persecuted and many martyrs to being legal, and then by the next generation it was favored. I mean, that is a huge shift in church history. Well, he built this church in 330. Uh, it was destroyed by fire during a revolt in 529. So this one didn't get the chance to get destroyed by the Persians or, 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 or one of the invading uh, warring Muslim armies or something. Uh, there was a riot in the Byzantine Empire and the church got burned down. Uh, of course, cities in the ancient world burned down an awful lot because there was a lot of fire and not much fire uh, uh, fighting capability. Shortly thereafter, it was rebuilt by the Emperor Justinian, one of the other great emperors of the late Roman Empire, and expanded. When we go inside, we will see some amazing mosaics that were put there by the Crusaders, but the building itself is more or is basically unchanged. All right, since Justinian rebuilt it uh, 1,500 years ago, and that was built uh, on the ruins of the one from the 300s. So this is, we're going way back in time here, uh, and you'll see that from the design. This is called the Door of Humility, uh, and it's quite low. Uh, I, I basically had to bend in half to get through this. It's probably about four foot high, uh, and you're saying, why on earth would they brick up the door? Because it, they did, very clearly, right? Uh, don't you need a bigger door for an important church? Sure. Uh, and so I said to myself, there must be a story, and I found it. Uh, in the 16th century, when the Ottoman Empire controlled this area, uh, of course, people were bringing their horses and their cattle into the courtyard and into the uh, por portions of the church. There was no respect for the sacredness of the space, so the people there at the time, again, the church was in great disrepair in this era, uh, et cetera, et cetera, they said, well, we can stop people from bringing horses and cows in. <laughs> we'll just make the door so small that nobody can get in. Uh, and, and sure enough, uh, that was the end of horses at the very least getting through there. So what do you see when you come inside? Just a couple steps beyond this door is this. We'll look ahead and there's some amazing close-up shots of some of these things, but the basic design is one very familiar in church history. All right, we have the nave, which is this main aisle where, that we are looking down. That's number two on the map. Uh, we have the chancel up front. That is the, the place where, where most of the worship service is taking place, where the priest is going to stand for most of it. Uh, and of course, you have the narthex, which is the entrance way. We'll, work, we'll walk, go all the way up to the front and explain that part later, but if you're not familiar with those terms. This is a sizable space, is it not? some huge beams uh, holding up the roof, and you can see some murals. We're gonna take a closer look, and here you go. These are what remains of the Crusader era mosaics, 12th century, all right? So 800-year-old mosaics on these walls, uh, and they originally covered both sides. That would have been a sight to see when it was new. Uh, they began restoring, doing restoration work in 2015. I'll show you a close-up in a minute to see the before and the after. You can see on the other side, this is the opposite side, uh, that there is a portion there as well. Obviously, a lot of it either couldn't be restored, it was probably too far gone, uh, or they've not yet uh, done so. But that's a before and after. 
This isn't a picture I took because, of course, I wasn't there for the before and the after, uh, but it shows you basically the work that these restoration artists, they're artists in their own right, do by probably having to remove every little tile, cleaning it, uh, replacing the ones that are missing, uh, and making it look uh, like it was new. Um, and it certainly uh, is a beautiful art form uh, that, that is very common in this era. Just four more pictures when I looked around at the different places. We were standing in line for a good while here uh, to see the part that we're going to get to in a minute. So we had time to wander out of the line and, and take pictures at things. Uh, one of the things that are everywhere in this church are sanctuary lamps. These little lamps that, that, that you can put a candle into or maybe an oil lamp, uh, there are like dozens and dozens of these things hanging everywhere, uh, such that if you're fairly tall and you're walking around, you're gonna smack yourself in the face on these if you're not looking where you're going because they were everywhere. These are Crusader murals. Uh, paintings that were on these columns. Basically, the, every column has a painting. And of course, if you were an art historian and you had, took the time, all of them, you could go around and say, oh, this is this person and this is that person. Not something that, that we took the time doing, but again, so that's an 800-year-old painting uh, on here and that has survived. That's quite incredible. But even more so, the floor. You're saying to yourself, as I said before, older is lower, right? This is the original floor. You can see how much lower the original floor of Justinian's rebuilt church was from 1,500 years ago. You can see that Byzantine-era tiled mosaic floor Obviously, I didn't take the picture on the right. It's in black and white. It's from the 1930s when they were doing the restoration work. You can see they dug down to, find, to get to that original floor. And if you go back and look at the floor, uh, da, 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 now, where's the floor, where's the floor? You can see the different sections where the wood is now covering up where it's been excavated. Uh, they don't open it up all the time, of course, because they're trying to preserve that. Uh, we were fortunate enough that our guide knew a guy, uh, as he knew a guy everywhere. He was awesome. Uh, and he spoke to him in Aramaic and, and got him to lift up uh, and let us see these Crusader, or excuse me, Byzantine era crosses. There is a whole bunch of different designs that the Byzantines used for a cross. This is one of them uh, as well. And so this goes back. 1,500 years on this tiled floor that is about eh, three feet below the modern floor, uh, of course, and you can see that work that was done then. Uh, and now, of course, it's all covered. Uh, they haven't excavated all of it because you can see where, where, where they haven't done sections. And you can see everybody in our group holding their phone up out trying to take a picture, right? Uh, I'm a little bit taller, so I held my phone above their phones, uh, but, but we were all crowding around trying, and you could see all the shadows of everyone's phones. This is what happens in the modern world when we go somewhere, right? All we see is pictures of people taking pictures. Uh, this, is, this is, and we were no different, of course. Now, the grotto is where everyone wants to go. Everyone was waiting in line to get to see the grotto, uh, and we'll go to the grotto in just a minute. It le it's beneath the chancel, all right? The chancel is the part of the church near the altar, and you're saying, I don't see an altar. Where's the altar? It's behind the gilded iconostasis. That's a fancy term, uh, but that is highly gilded and highly fancy, right? That is an awful lot of gold, uh, gold filigree, right, gold leafing uh, on this uh, iconostasis. And the chancel uh, is, is the area right in front of it. The sanctuary, we, when we use, as Protestants, we use the word sanctuary, we mean the whole space that we worship in, right? I, I say, oh, church is in the sanctuary. Uh, that's not what they mean in an Orthodox or a Catholic church. The sanctuary is the place where the altar is. And in this case, they happen to open the door one moment while, uh, for a minute where you can see the altar. The altar is actually behind there. 
and one of the priests, don't know if he was Orthodox or Armenian, uh, not Catholic because of the garb, but you can see all of the, all of the lamps hanging down. Uh, they are indeed everywhere. The altar uh, is behind that. All right, and there is an evolving, if you ever want to look it up, there's an, evo an amazing story in the evolution of church architecture, where things are placed in the church, where, how the priest and the, the altar and the people interact down through the centuries. It's an ever-evolving kind of thing, of course. Uh, it was only in Vatican II, right, here in America that the priest turned around and started facing the people. Uh, as you can see, this is not designed for the people to participate in that, right? They are on the other side of this screen from where the priest is going to be at the altar. Uh, but that is, again, that is uh, a very, very Eastern, very ancient uh, method of doing things. But you can see just how ornate this is, and there's a different picture from a slightly different angle. You can see some more mosaics on the wall uh, that are restored as well. So we're waiting in line, we're waiting in line, and as I'm waiting, I turn around, and there's just stuff everywhere. Hundreds of years old, who knows how old these various uh, paintings and icons are. You can see the, 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 the uh, paintings on the columns. We know that those are 800 plus years old. Uh, and so if, you know, you want something to look at while you're waiting in line, right? We took our daughter to Disney World a couple years ago, and they've got lots of stuff for you to look at while you're waiting in line, right? That's their thing because kids know, no patience. You're waiting in line at the Church of the, whole, uh, of the Nativity, and so it's your fault if you don't find something to look at because there is so much stuff here. And we didn't see quite as much woodwork, but I thought that woodwork, that carving was uh, incredible as well. Uh, so we are standing in line and we happen to be behind Brazilians. I told you last week that we saw people from everywhere, right? Uh, from Africa, from Asia, from South America. This time we were talking to Brazilians. They spoke English because we don't speak Portuguese. No one in our group did, so that was helpful. Turns out the gentleman in front of us, uh, his, I think it was his son, went to school uh, here in the Midwest. And so, you know, and, and you know, I'm like, oh, that's near us, you know, uh, close enough. Um, really, uh, and so we were talking about that. They, 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 he loved America, yada, yada. Uh, so we're heading to the grotto. You're, what's in the grotto? This is heading toward the entrance. Again, you can see this painting uh, uh, and, and the ones on the top, they're very old, uh, very, very amazing. These are, you know, irreplaceable pieces of art, right? This stuff is not, not, not being replaced if, if it's ever damaged. And then you head to the entrance of the grotto and you're saying to yourself, that this, this is looking uh, a little sketch, and you go down basically into a cave system that is beneath the church. This cave system actually connects this church to the chapel next door that we're gonna look at next. It's a, it's a serious number of caves. And as you go down in there, and everybody's waiting in line, you're like, what are we waiting in line for, right? <laughs> We're all, there's a line, we should wait in it, right? Let's get in line. We are waiting in line for this. I didn't take the picture on the right. You can see that the, that the, uh, the purple is different than when we were there. Uh, it's a 14-point silver star that was installed in 1717. Uh, 14 points because of the 14 generations in, in Matthew's genealogy from here to here and here to there. Traditionally, again, as we've said, as I've said a number of times, right? Traditionally is what it is. Uh, this tradition goes back to the 300s. Who knows how accurate it is? That's what they thought. Traditionally, the hole in the center allows you to touch the stone on which Mary sat to give birth to Jesus. I don't know if she sat on a stone to give birth to Jesus or if there was a wooden stool of some kind or she stood up or she laid down. I have no idea. But that's what the tradition says. And so, of course, pilgrims from all over the world for 1,700 years have wanted to come here to go down into the grotto to bend down to touch that stone. And most of the people in our group did as well. Uh, but like many of these spots, just like in the Holy Sepulchre uh, that we're gonna see a little bit later, it's 
let's go, we gotta keep going, right? Because so many people wanna get through here every single day. Uh, so we, were, we probably had, I don't know, 20 seconds apiece to be in front here, and then it was, then the, the priest actually, the monk or whoever was on duty was like, get out. He's basically telling our tour guide, get your people out of here, uh, because another group is right behind us and they wanna see it too. Well, you turn around, and it's the grotto of the manger. It's the traditional site of the manger in which Mary placed Jesus. Of course, it doesn't look like it would have then. Nothing looks like it, would, uh, it did then, right? Because they built up a church in the 300s over the site, and then that one burned down, and then they built up another one. So it doesn't look like it did, but this is the place that, that in the 300s they said this is where it was. So we went down there. Next door is the Church of St. Catherine, a fourth century martyr. Uh, and by next door, I'll show you how close it was in just a minute. This is a neo-Gothic church from the 19th century. So no, not ancient, but right next to the Church of the Holy, uh, of the Nativity. Uh, and it sits atop a Byzantine monastery that stood on the site. So again, it's been a place of worship uh, going back uh, to the early church, you can see uh, a fairly modern church. How close? This close. We go out the courtyard, turn around from that church, and there's the door to, to the nave of the Church of the Nativity. They are literally sharing interior walls. Uh, it's a part of that agreement, right, between the Catholics, the Armenians, and the Orthodox about who can share the space. So when uh, the... Catholic uh, bishop, uh, patriarch, who has the, the right to do the Christmas Eve Mass, does so, he does it in here. Uh, it's right next door uh, to, to where everything uh, is, but you can see uh, that's a, uh, an entrance or a look light back to the beginning of the line that we stood in. Questions about Bethlehem and the Church of the Nativity before we move on to Jerusalem. I need a drink of water anyway. So, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, there's certainly a local community. There's a local community that will be there for the service this year. How many outside uh, people? Probably hardly none, right? Because travel will be restricted. Uh, it's not the safest time to be in the West Bank. Uh, as a foreigner, um, and so it'll probably be fairly sparse. Normally, it would be packed, right? Because everybody's gonna wanna be there for the Christmas Eve service. Just like Jerusalem is packed every Easter uh, for Holy Week, uh, it's the same kind of thing. This year, there won't be that much. But, but again, these churches have their regular church services happening every week right? Uh, the normal ones that they do. And in most of these holy sites, there are daily services, daily prayers, daily uh, things happening. Uh, and they just, they just go about that business. And basically, they don't even really pay any attention to the pilgrims uh, and the tourists walking around. Uh, they're, they're used to us, right? I mean, this, that's what you do. Uh, and so the locals, uh, they, they come uh, and they worship here. Uh, there are a number of churches in Bethlehem, of course, it's not the only one, uh, but this is, this is obviously the most famous and the most ancient of them all. All right, the rest of our time, uh, and we'll see how far we get in the story of Jerusalem, is in Jerusalem. We were in and out of Jerusalem over four days, but rather than show you the other places we went to, I put all of the Jerusalem stuff together because I thought it made a lot more sense. So what do we know about Jerusalem, right? It's one of a significant number of places in Israel and Palestine that are sacred to Christians, Muslims, and Jews. Right? Of course, Bethlehem is like that, right? The Muslims believe Jesus was the second greatest prophet, uh, and so it's a sacred site to them. Obviously, Bethlehem is sacred to the Jews because of David and the patriarch, uh, patriarchs and Rachel's tomb, and to the Christians as well. Jerusalem has that in spades. Everywhere you turn, there is something that is sacred to one of the three religions, and sometimes to all three at the same time, which is what makes it very interesting. It was first settled over 5,000 years ago, so more than 3,000 BC, destroyed twice. 
I mean like destroyed, right? 586 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians uh, famously captured in, the, the, in Jeremiah and in Isaiah and in the text of the scriptures uh, that talk about it. And they wrecked the place, destroyed most of the walls, destroyed the temple, right? It was a mess afterwards. And then in 70 AD, the Romans went one better. Basically, the Romans said, we're going to knock everything down. They were not in a good mood after that, that uh, war, uh, after that uprising, and they destroyed it. Jerusalem has been besieged 23 times, put under siege, captured or recaptured, right? Sometimes it goes back and forth, back and forth during one, one war, 44 times. So a little bit of war, right? A little bit of violence. Uh, a whole lot of trouble happened in this place over the last 5,000 years. Now, the walls that we will see are only 500 years old. They're the new walls, right, built by the Ottomans, Suleiman the Magnificent, in 1538. They look really old, but they are not the walls of David. Then they're certainly not even the walls of Jesus' day. Uh, they're only from the last 500 years. I'll show you the difference from the layers in a later picture. Now, there are about 900,000 people living in Jerusalem, depending on where you draw the boundaries. Of the, today, the modern city of Jerusalem, it is a modern city. It has sports stadiums, it has shopping centers, it has universities, it has everything, a, a trolley car system, or, or a, not trolley car, a, a, uh, an above ground subway system. Um, 60% of Jerusalem right now is Jewish, 40% Palestinian, about 4% of which, about 4% mostly Palestinians, but a few of the Jews, are, are Christians. So it's mostly a Jewish and Palestinian city at this point in history. Of course, that has varied greatly over the years. Where did we stay? Our hotel, uh, that's uh, the map feature on my phone, I brought it up uh, to see where we were. Our hotel is where it says our hotel. It's the little blue dot. Uh, the old city is the gray at the bottom, and the Damascus Gate is where we went in most of the time. We're basically, here's the picture from our, the, our hotel room, a half mile from the Damascus Gate. And I'm saying, that's pretty sweet, right? We get back at the end of our tour, six o'clock, dinner, eat dinner, and we're like, hey, it's, it's, it's the spring. Uh, it's going to be light for another two hours. Let's go somewhere, right? Let's go. So what did we do? We took self-guided tour number one. Uh, and that's a quote from Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade. Follow me, I know the way. Said by Marcus Brody, if you love your Indiana Jones. Of course, he didn't know where he was going. I was hoping to do a little bit better, but before we got to dinner on that first night in Jerusalem, I said to the people on the bus, I'm walking into Jerusalem after dinner. Anybody want to go with me? Uh, and we had been to, to Beit Shean, we had, or no, we'd been to Bethlehem uh, and, and somewhere else. Most everyone was exhausted. It was a hot day. But these intrepid souls, these nine brave souls, my wife to the left and then others from our group said, we will follow you and we'll see what happens. Uh, and so where did we go? We walked up that half mile to the Damascus Gate. And again, those look like really old walls. They're 500 years old, that's a long time, right? L older than um, anything in America that Americans built, uh, but still, the modern ones from the 16th century. Uh, and so when we talk about inside the city versus outside the city, the old city, where these walls are now are not where they were in the time of Christ. So all the time, right, when we get to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, it's inside the city. And you're saying, how could this be where Jesus was crucified? He was crucified outside the city. Everybody knows that. Well, these aren't, this isn't where the walls were 1,600 years before they built this set. All right, the city was bigger then, and so they built the walls out further. Uh, but these are those walls, and because it was the end of a Sabbath, there wasn't much happening at this gate. But every other day that we went there, there were vendors everywhere around these steps selling watermelon and fruit and vegetables and, and, and everything that you can imagine, uh, because this is a city, uh, and a lot of people live in here, and there's no Walmart to be seen, right? There's no, none of that kind of thing happening around here. 
Just, down, just further up the eastern wall, uh, or excuse me, the northern wall, east of the Damascus Gate is Herod's Gate. That's pretty normal. That's a regular looking gate, nothing too exciting about it. Uh, but if you want to walk the Via de la Rosa, and we'll show you the steps uh, each uh, as, we, as we get into this, uh, this is one, the easiest way to get there because you're not that far from uh, the first station of the cross when you go in this gate. And then around to the other side, as we move around to the western side, is the Jaffa Gate. Uh, and that tower in the distance is the Tower of David. Uh, so called, not because David built it, of course, that was a long time ago, uh, but that's the name that has been associated with it. And you can see that the modern road goes underneath. All right, it is not easy to put in a subway line or a road uh, in, or a parking garage in modern Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. Because as soon as you start to dig, you find stuff. And what you find is probably gonna be sacred to either Jews, Muslims, or Christians. And the group that thinks that, that it's their site is gonna be mad and protest and maybe throw rocks and it's gonna get ugly. Um, and so, no doubt that was, that, that was quite the delicate thing, putting this tunnel here, uh, but traffic in Jerusalem is insane, all right? It, it, for one thing, there are a thousand tour buses trying to get in and around, or get around, they can't go in, trying to get around the old city and drop people off here, there, and everywhere. Uh, on one occasion, our bus driver dropped us off on the western side. We went in the Jaffa Gate and came out all the way on the other side of the city where he picked us up because there was nowhere for him to park. He just drove around while we were in there uh, because there was literally nowhere to park. And when our, our guide says, hey, we're ready, he says, all right, and he meets us there, pulls up, we jump in, and he keeps going uh, because that's how, how crazy it is uh, in that respect. You probably want a map so you can get a feel for the city, right? This is basically an understanding of the city. I told you about the Tower of David, that's in yellow. The Jaffa Gate is right there. The Damascus Gate is on the top. The Herod's Gate to the right. We went out the Lion's Gate when we came in the other side. I'll also show you the Dung Gate uh, and that side when we went in there. Now, actually a, a pundit, I won't mention this particular pundit because it's, it's quite sad. Recently, was, after the, war, the, 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 the current war started, was complaining about there being ghettos in Jerusalem and people not being allowed to live uh, or leave certain parts of the city or live in certain parts of the city. That's all hogwash. It, it's easily refuted. Anyone with, with, a, with an ounce of, of, of Google searching ability would be able to fix that, but, uh, but that particular pundit wanted to, to make things seem uh, what they were, and now you're going to go home and look it up and try to figure out who it was. If you really want to know, I'll tell you after we're done. Um, it's not segregated. The city is not segregated, all right? These quarters are the result of uh, a 19th century Ottoman administration. The Ottomans had districts when they were administering the city, and this is the, the, what, how they divided it up, and a British map labeled them this way. The Muslim quarter, the Jewish quarter, the Christian quarter, and the Armenian quarter. It is true that more Christians live in the Christian quarter, but that doesn't mean that Muslims don't own buildings there or live there or Jews. Uh, it, it happens all the time. Actually, real estate here is very difficult to get, right? People want to live in the old city. All right, people want to die in the old city. It's a place they want to go. And so renting out properties here is a, is a real big deal. Um, so this is really just helpful for trying to figure out where you are in the old city. When you see a sign on the wall that says Muslim Quarter, you're like, oh, okay, now I know. We're in the northeast part, <laughs> somewhere part of the city, and we wanted to be on the western side, so we gotta go this way, right? That's about all the good it does right now. You can see the Via Dolorosa on there uh, from the Temple Mount going to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, and you're saying it's right in the middle of the city. Again, the it wasn't 2,000 years ago. This was outside the city. Uh, and that's why these sites are where they are. 
Uh, our tour, went, again, went in the Jaffa Gate and out the Lion's Gate. The bus went around. We also went in the Dung Gate. Uh, our explorers, our group, went in and out the Damascus Gate several times because it was the closest by foot uh, to where we were going. We didn't go on to the Temple Mount. You can't just walk into the Temple Mount, okay? It's not a, it's a thing. You, there are, it's a checkpoint. There's a security checkpoint to get there. Uh, and we walked up to it and there were Israeli soldiers standing there and they're just like, you can't go in. I'm like, I, I know, we're not trying to go in. I just wanted to, just wanted to look, see what you can see from here. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's a serious thing. You, you have to have all sorts of permissions and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's not the kind of thing that tourists can just wander around on the Temple Mount. That's not going to happen. Uh, so we didn't go there. Um, what about the city itself? 35,000 people live in the old city. And they need to eat uh, and buy things and shop. Uh, and just inside the Damascus Gate, there's a whole bunch of people selling uh, local produce. And there were a lot of candy stores. If you like bulk candy, you can't really get bulk candy in America anymore. They, they've kind of gone away from that. But if you want bulk candy, you can get it in the old city in Jerusalem. There were like, I don't know, at least a dozen stores like this uh, where, where you could just stop. Uh, our group when, uh, that I was leading, we had one particular uh, couple that wanted to stop and look in every shop and we're trying to explore this city and we're like, come on, come on. <laughs> you know, it's a shop, they're selling stuff, who cares? Uh, but but uh, because I didn't uh, very much care about that. This is basically what the old city looks like uh, as you wander the main streets. Little shops on the first floor, people living on the second floor, uh, and they're selling everything you can imagine, right? All the kinds of tourist things that you would expect. On the right-hand side is, is, is a shop that was selling uh, icons and uh, carved things and all sorts of stuff. You even see some menorahs at the top. But again, again, the people living in here doing business depend upon the pilgrims and the tourists. What Muslim, Christian, and, and Jewish, because uh, that's, there's an awful lot of business to be had. Uh, no doubt some of it is, is junk that's made in China and not authentic at all, but a lot of it is locally made. Uh, and, and you just have to be careful when, when you're buying stuff to make sure you're getting something that's made here locally uh, and, and not uh, overseas and shipped in just for tourists. But that's true anytime you go to a tourist place, right? <laughs> it's no, no different in that respect. Now, the only spot that we saw, and there might be some other ones, but this is the only one that we found, in the whole old city where we could say, these are stones on which Jesus may have walked, were these ones right here. They, are ten, they were 10 feet below the modern paving stones. They're not right now. There's not a 10-foot hole right here. They excavated them. They brought them up off of the old pavement, the old level, and then relayed them here. And, of course, it, uh, as you can see, people had no problem throwing their cigarettes uh, down on the ground there, uh, which is kind of gross. But any which way, so these stones were ones in the city of Herod, the city of Jesus, right? Uh, that's the kind of stones that he would have walked on. But right now... All of those street levels are about 10 feet below the modern. That's how much rubble accumulated from that destruction in 70 AD, from the other times the city was burned or ransacked uh, and whatnot. 10 feet in the last 2,000 years. It's deeper than that in other places, and I will show you that. But I thought that was pretty cool. I don't know if he stepped on this stone or that stone. Maybe Peter stepped on that one. No idea, right? Because this, we don't know where this exactly was uh, back in the day. None of these streets are what they were before. None of these buildings are what they were before. That's just not, because again, the Romans destroyed the whole place. This is a typical residential street in the old city. My wife and I, after the group got tired, we just wandered around some more and took some side streets just to see what is it like living in the old city. Uh, and as you can see, a uh, lot of scooters, 
Uh, no, uh, some people bring cars in here, but it's not exactly car friendly. It wasn't designed for that. Uh, and of course, because of the layers of rubble, uh, we are not looking at the city of Jesus let alone the city of Nehemiah, which is lower, let alone the city of David, which is lower than that. That's just this much time does that. Does that make sense? So these paving stones, these are fairly modern. Again, when we're talking about fairly modern over there, we're talking 500 years or less. Uh, but again, no, 2,000, 2,500, 3,000 years ago, no, you're not seeing that, with rare exceptions. So what does that mean? None of these are my pictures. All the rest were mine. None of these are mine because we weren't able to go look at any of the underground digs. Uh, I wish we had, uh, but it's the kind of thing that's not easy to get to. Uh, and there is a plenty of archeology span happening under the old city. Massively controversial, every once in a while leads to violence. Uh, when something happens, but there's so much under the old city. Like this built, like this room on the bottom left here is underground. Uh, when it was buried, it was buried whole. It didn't collapse or anything. And there are plenty of places like that that now are beginning to be excavated again. It's very delicate. It has to be done right. Uh, in the 18th uh, late 1800s into the 20th century, a lot of Protestants uh, were doing this excavation work, working with the Ottomans, and then of course the British. Now, now that the Israelis control Jerusalem, they're the ones deciding who can dig where uh, and, and issuing all of the permits. Um, so that is just, again, it, this is the same story in Constantinople, the same story in Rome, or the same story in any of these cities that have been occupied for thousands of years. There's an underground, a uh, uh, vast store of things to be uncovered at some point. We wandered around that first night and we came across this and I said, man, that's small, what is that? And I leaned in through the fence and said, what is this thing? This is a marker that shows where the Knights of St. John, better known as the Knights Hospitaller, or however you want to pronounce it, one of the Crusader military orders. They were formed in order to make hospitals for pilgrims. People came to Jerusalem sometimes because they were seeking healing, right? They were ill and they thought if I go to the holy city, maybe I'll, and they might need a hospital. But also it was an arduous journey, a dangerous journey. Uh, people would come, fall ill. And so they built a hospital here in the old city uh, about 900 years ago, before the just before the crusader period started. And then once the crusades start, this becomes an actual military order of knights uh, these are the knights that held Rhodes in the Eastern Mediterranean and later Malta, where they were, uh, they held, held off a, a siege. Uh, they were a big part of that centuries long fight between Muslim armies and Habsburg uh, armies, papal armies uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. But they started out as a, as a group of people that just wanted to make a hospital. Uh, and then it, history uh, helped morph that. Let's pause for a minute before we dig into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is one of, of course, the biggest highlights of the trip. We are in good shape on our time, so I'm gonna take a drink. Questions thus far about the old city? We've got lots left to see, so I might not be, have gotten to it yet. Now this first picture, you're thinking, that doesn't look like much of much. It's just a building from the outside, right? One's what's on the inside matters. I didn't take the picture on the right because we didn't get to go up on whatever roof that was taken from, but you can see the domes of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Again, built in 335 by Constantine the Great, same guy that built the original Church of the Nativity. It's the traditional site of both the crucifixion and the empty tomb. Whether or not they were that close, I have no idea. Uh, the sites within the church are about 60 feet apart. 
It was a nearby tomb, right? That's what the text tells us. How nearby, I don't know. Are they, did they have the right spot? No idea. But these are the traditional sites. Uh, we'll look at one of the, uh, the garden tomb later. Uh, next, uh, we'll see if we get there this week. If you walk the stations of the cross, the actual Via Dolorosa, the last four stations are in the building. All right, so you get done uh, with 10, and then 11, 12, 13, and 14 are here inside. If you've walked stations on our Good Friday crosswalk, you might be familiar with them. Uh, since 1757, uh, Catholic, Greek, Orthodox, and Arme Armenian churches, just like the Church of the Nativity, have shared control of this building. This is the place where fistfights used to break out back in the day between the various monks over who got to do what, when, and how. Uh, seems ridiculous, but these are guys that are extremely passionate about this spot, uh, and if they think that the other guys are trying to pull one over on us, uh, and so that's eventually what the Ottomans did was put this agreement in place and say, just stop, we, we, it tires us out, they didn't care. Uh, this is the layout of the building, and you can see it's, it's quite a warren of different adjoining rooms. Uh, when you walk inside, you're trying to figure out, okay, where are things, what can we look at, and, and truly we only saw basically the white spaces um, uh, of the building. Uh, that's the current layout of the current church. Uh, the destruction of the original church, uh, after it had survived danger numerous times from fire and earthquake, as again, in this area of the world is earthquake prone, so a lot of buildings are destroyed by earthquakes. Fire is a th constant thing, so a lot of buildings are destroyed by fire. In 1009, the caliph, uh, the Fatimad caliph, that's a, that's a dynasty uh, that ruled Palestine at the time. Uh, the man in charge was not altogether sane, and he, uh, history, uh, many accounts say that about him. Uh, he had this church destroyed in, in, a, in one, of his, one of his moments. Uh, by 1049, it had been rebuilt uh, on the ruins of the old. Nevertheless, when you start hearing about the preaching of the First Crusade, right, the men going out and saying, we gotta take the land back from the infidel, yada, yada, this destruction of this building was one of the main reasons that they got people fired up. They left off the part that it had already been rebuilt uh, and things were back to normal there because that's not what was being sold. Uh, but, so that is an interesting bit of history that the destruction of the building inspired a crusade to avenge the destruction when it had already been rebuilt. Uh, but when you're in the, you know, a thousand years ago, news travels at its own pace, so that's, that's what happened. This, and you can see it uh, sort of almost dead center. You see the step ladder? The famous ladder. Supposedly, that ladder was leaning against the wall doing some renovation work in 1757 when the edict came down that said, no more changes, we're all working together on this, and so they were like, now what? <laughs> we can't finish that job. I don't know what he was trying to do on that ladder. Who knows what was happening? Rumor has it that that's not the original ladder because by now the wood had deteriorated and someone put another one up there because it's an awesome tourist story. Uh, just to say how crazy the fight for control of this building has been down through the centuries. So in the 12th century, Salah uh, the one who recaptured Jerusalem from the Crusaders, entrusted the keys to the church to a, Nuz to a Muslim family. Uh, Nusaybes, I don't know how to pronounce the name, I, don't wanna, I hope I didn't butcher it. Uh, they had a good relationship with various Christian groups in the Holy Land going back to before the Islamic conquest. So they were a good choice for it, and that arrangement from the 12th century still continues to this day. We actually happened upon the locking of the doors on one of our trips in, and you're thinking, why are all these people gathering around in this entranceway? 
and this guy comes out with a stepladder and pulls that big door shut and gets out a big old iron key and lock, 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 and the building is locked for the night. That way, no, but no, the Armenians and the Orthodox and, and, the Greek, and the Catholics can't be thinking, what are they up to in the building tonight when we're not there, right? And everyone can go home and chill out because it's locked until morning. Uh, that is a, a weird way for things to happen, uh, but a descendant of that original family still does this every day. Unlocks the building in the morning, locks it at night. I think it was like seven o'clock at night uh, that they locked the building up. Uh, which I found to be fascinating. You can see that one of the main entrances has, was since bricked up. Uh, you can only use the one on the left now. Uh, for whatever reason, at some point, someone did, and there's a set of steps going off to the right. This is what happens when buildings have renovations and expansions over the centuries, right? Not everything always makes a lot of sense. So let's go inside the building. That's what you want to see. Right above the entrance, you can see the light, right, from the entrance. That was right there. You walk in the door, and there's a, a set of stairs going up right there. If you look up, and I had to, had to back up for this shot, if you look up, you can see the site of the 12th and 13th station of the cross. Uh, or excuse me, the 11th and the 12th. Uh, the traditional site of the crucifixion, uh, and there are two altars up there. Uh, I got a better shot of the stone of the anointing, in, uh, and we'll look at that in a minute. So let's go up there. Let's follow them in that order. On the right-hand side as you go up is called Calvary. It's the traditional site of station number 11. The, the, or, the Catholic shrine is on the right. The Greek Orthodox shrine is on the left. And this is the spot where this gentleman uh, was really annoyed with some of the tourists slash pilgrims, call them what you will, who were there with us. Not in our group, but when, in some of the other groups, because they were like getting in his way. He, he's got an incense thing and he's doing prayers because they do this every day, right? Uh, and, and, and he's trying to go about that and people were getting in his way and you could see that he wanted to, to, to yell at, at, at him, although who knows what language they spoke and whether or not they would have understood him. Uh, but it was a thing. On both sides of this altar, you can see through the glass a big old rock. Okay, what's the rock? And if you go down uh, underneath that altar, there's a hole and you can actually touch the rock. That's supposed to be, traditionally, the rock in which they put the cross that, 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 that Jesus was crucified on. Is it that rock? No idea. It's bedrock, and it would have been, the hill of Golgotha would have been somewhere, right? And so it's similar to that. Uh, it's not that far. We're on the right side of the city. It's around here somewhere, at the very least. Uh, so that is the traditional site, uh, and of course, all sorts of people are clamoring up there to take pictures and stand there. Uh, the only people that really annoyed me were the people that want to be like, you know, take, take like a hammy shot. I'm like, that's not what this is for, right? Uh, take a picture because it's, it's, you know, it's one of those spots that you want to know to take a picture of, but show a little bit of class. Most people were fine, but as you know, not everybody's going to be. You go up there. And then you turn around and you look down and you see the stone of anointing. Uh, and the entrance to the Atakul is at the top right. We'll look at that one next. The stone of anointing is the traditional site where Jesus' body was prepared for his burial. They had to do that somewhere around here, right? Had to, to lay his body down and wrap it and prepare it with, uh, for burial. Uh, and so most people who visit uh, come and, and kneel and place their hand there and say a prayer, do whatever, uh, and spend a few moments. So you've got three stations of the cross, right? Uh, of Jesus' crucifixion, his death, uh, 11, 12, and then 13 is the preparation for the burial. Uh, 14 is this place. Uh, the Atacul, uh, it's a Latin word for chapel, so fancy. Uh, this particular building inside a building was built in 1555 to house what, was, what is known as the Angel's Stone. 
Again, traditionally, that's a fragment of that big old stone that was rolled away from the entrance to the tomb. You can go inside this thing. I didn't take any pictures on the inside because it didn't seem like a thing, but also you, the inside of this is about eight feet by six feet by four feet, all right? And we had four people in there with us, my wife, myself, and two others that happened to be in front of us in line. We went there that first night, we got in line and we got in after about a 40 minute wait. When our group came back, the line was three times as long, it would have been a, like a two hour wait. Uh, and of course, we were in there for 20 seconds. Uh, but again, everybody wants to go in here and there is a monk uh, on the outside telling people to go in. You have to go in this door and then back out this same door. So it's not good for traffic flow. And there's one on the inside that, that lets everybody kneel, say whatever prayer you want for 30 seconds, and then he's like, get out, get out. Uh, and, and so it was super crowded in there. I actually didn't, didn't kneel down and, and, and touch the stone or anything because I'm, again, I'm 6'1". I didn't know that I could get, but my wife and these other two ladies were, were already taking up all the space that was in there. Uh, it's, it's, again, yeah, if you're claustrophobic, it's a very small space. Uh, but, but that is uh, one of the traditional sites. It's obviously these are some of the most holy sites in Christian history. Uh, that traditionally are associated with these places. Uh, and while you're waiting in line, of course, it's a beautiful spot to stand and look at everything uh, at the dome that was built uh, when they rebuilt the church uh, around this place. We didn't get a chance to go in here because it was roped off. This is known as the Greek choir. Uh, again, a lovely, uh, beautiful space of worship, and you can see the dome at the end. That's one of the domes that we saw. Questions about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, and uh, when we get look at the Via de la Rosa, I'll show you those pictures again, uh, because of course, uh, but I wanted to just focus in on the church itself. You walk around, you walk around a corner, and, and there's the square, and it's right there. Uh, it, it's not like, uh, you know, it's got like the Church of the Nativity where this big giant space, right? It's a narrow street, you know, one of those narrow streets, you turn a corner and there, there it is. You can go from two different directions uh, to get to it. Uh, the other thing that was fascinating is, is that while we were there, uh, there's a little chapel just off to the side of, of the tomb uh, and a priest was going in and starting a service and Nicole's like, sweet. I'd love to take mass here in, in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Of course, it was in Spanish, because uh, that's the group that he was with. But you can muddle through. You know the stuff, when to stand up, when to sit down, that kind of thing. Uh, and so I sat outside. I actually talked to a homeless person for about 20 minutes. Uh, I think she was from Eastern Europe. The, her accent was very thick. Uh, but I was trying to, I was like, I don't know where, <laughs> how to get you help in Jerusalem. Right, I, I don't know what number to call. She said she'd already stayed at the shelter, but after three months, you have to get out kind of thing. And, and you know, MJ was in social services. You know, sometimes you're like, ah, I don't know how to help. I want to help, but I don't know how to help. Uh, but it was a, you know, I'm just sitting there waiting for her to come out. Uh, and this lady sits down next to me. We talked for about 20 minutes um, while we were sitting there. All right, uh, let's continue through Jerusalem. Let's talk about the walls. The 16th century walls only partly reflect the location of the walls of the city at the time of Christ. Again, some of them are in the same spots, but most of them are greatly expanded out, especially to the north and the west. For example, the traditional site of the crucifixion and burial, we're outside the walls then, but are inside the walls now. Uh, of course, the Temple Mount uh, was left intact. The foundation on which the temple area sat, the Romans didn't destroy. That would have been a lot of work. They just destroyed everything on top of it and most of the rest of the city. So let's take a look at a pair of maps that compare that. The city walls of Herod and in, in Christ's time are on the top left. You can see that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is outside of that, right? Uh, 
and you can see where the Temple Mount is. Hezekiah's Tunnel, we'll get there um, as well. You can see now the 16th century walls are further north. And that southern section is no longer inside the city walls. Uh, and now the Temple Mount is kind of at the bottom right side, whereas before it was in the top right side. So again, the city walls are not where they once were, but a lot of things that were inside then are inside now, and some th things have shifted we showed you the Tower of David. Uh, this is one of 34 towers uh, built along the 16th century city walls, but it was built on the ruins of a tower on this spot that goes back to the city of David. So it's not David's tower in the sense that this was built by him, but there was one here from his city. Uh, notice the lower stones. You see how they're larger at the bottom? That's because those are ancient ones. When the Ottomans built the, the upper walls in the 16th century, they used much smaller stones. That's where you can, how you can tell the age. And so the foundations of this modern, modern, I keep saying modern, 16th century tower uh, are, uh, is at the top. The bottom goes back to the time of Christ or earlier. Uh, and this is, part, uh, to me, a fascinating part of the story. Uh, the walls of the Temple Mount were originally 105 feet tall. 105 feet. That's a pretty good sized foundation to build your temple on, right? Herod, right, did that work over decades. That work was still ongoing when Jesus uh, lived, and actually that work wasn't even fully finished when the Romans destroyed the city, uh, but that was a huge project. 62 feet of, the, of that is below street level now. So the 40% the you can still see for, most, for the most part, and this is one of the places where you can see lower than most, uh, for the most part, you're not seeing the ancient Temple Mount because it's below ground. There were 45 layers. 28 of them are currently above ground. 17 uh, are underground. That sounds flip-flopped because I said more is underground than above, but the bottom layers are taller uh, because, again, they were bigger stones. Uh, so see the picture, the arrow on the left? Right, see that, that tree there and those buildings? That's the street level of modern Jerusalem, of the old city today. The city in Jesus' time was down here where the second arrow is. That's not a small amount of difference, all right? Again, the Romans destroyed the whole place. They knocked all that rubble around, and when they rebuilt the city later, they just built on top. Nobody cleared off all the rubble and went all the way back down to the bottom. That's just not how they did it in the ancient world. They just leveled it off, brought in some new dirt, you know, got it flat, and then built again. The Wailing Wall, the very famous Wailing Wall, we'll look at it next, is at that level. Just on the other side of that brown, uh, brownish building is the Wailing Wall. So when the Jews are standing at the Wailing Wall, they're looking at, they're most of the way up the wall. Uh, way above where Jesus would have been in his day, certainly above uh, the ancient city as well. The section of, in the middle, see how it's kind of like that, kind of uneven? There was covered uh, walkways and tunnels and whatnot here, and when the Romans knocked all those big stones off, some of it collapsed, some of it remained intact, and when they got all this rubble, they excavated, right? Uh, there, I, I saw a picture from the 19th century that's like 30 feet higher, because the, the excavators brought all that rubble out, and when you get down to this level, you see some of it collapsed and some of it maintains its shape. That's why it's all uneven uh, like that here from when the Romans knocked those huge stones off the top, which would have had quite an impact uh, when they came crashing down. Notice the craftsmanship, okay? Do you, do you see how uh, the stones towards the top are a little more pocked 
uh, marked and jagged and whatnot, that's because they've been exposed to the elements. This bottom, these bottom courses were underground until modern excavation, so they were protected. But notice those joints. These, these are 2,000-year-old walls built in the time of Herod, uh, by Herod the Great, and, and they're straight and true. Uh, they did some seriously uh, good work back in the day, uh, and these were big. And you're saying to yourself, how big? I added one slide. I added this slide today. We didn't talk about it, uh, and I didn't notice it. I didn't take the picture to the right because we couldn't get this angle from where we were standing. But this little bit jutting out there uh, on the top is Robinson's Arch, so named because Edward Robinson looked at that in 1838 and said, you know what? That's the start of an old archway. And this on the top right is an artist's guess at what it would have looked like. All right. There's another one further up called Wilson's Arch. It's the same thing. You can see these little stones sticking out, and you realize there used to be a big arch here. Because, of course, people had to get to the top of the Temple Mount, right? Uh, because that's where the temple was, uh, and at least Jewish men could go up there for various things, uh, and they, there was a lot of uh, that going on. And so I thought that was interesting. Uh, our guy didn't point it out. He was talking about other things. And where did that, uh-oh, I lost a slide. Uh-oh, uh, uh, uh. Well, shoot. All right, I'm missing a slide. I'll have to put it back in and show you again next week. Because there is a picture. See this uh, stone? Mm. This stone right here on the, sec on the, on the right-hand side, the second one up? That stone goes that way about 17 feet. And I know that because he got all the pastors in our group, and there were seven of us, uh, and said, you touch a stone, you touch a stone. We all backed up. I was in the back, uh, and I don't know what happened to that slide. I must have accidentally lost it. Uh, and we were all touching the same stone. It's like, and you can see how far it goes that way. It goes like six feet that way. So it's like 17 by six by maybe three. And it's not one of the biggest ones. The bigger ones are lower uh, yet. Uh, they've discovered one uh, closer to the, uh, further up that way, that, that is massive. How did they get them there? No idea, right? Uh, manpower, pulleys, oxen, oxen something. Uh, these are huge stones that they used to build this. Now, I said there aren't very many spots where you can say Jesus stood here, right? This one we absolutely can. Because we know that Jesus came from Bethany, south of Jerusalem, into Jerusalem many times. And the main way to get in was to go up these steps. These are known as the teaching steps, which lead to the Hulda gates, and I'll show you the gates in a minute. This has been, in the modern times, excavated down to the level of what existed in the time of Christ. Okay? You can see how far below the, the modern street level we are, because that's way up there. Um, when Herod the Great upgraded the temple, these, this entranceway was part of that reconstruction. When Jesus walked Jerusalem, there were 11 gates to the city. Uh, now, four of those have been sealed. Uh, a couple, two of them uh, lead into the Temple Mount, and for obvious reasons, uh, traffic in and out of the Temple Mount is very much controlled today. Do you see the gates? You see the arch? I haven't done this much. They're right here. One, two, three. Now, does it, now do you see it? It was an underground entrance to the Temple Mount that Herod had built uh, so that you could go up and then en go underground and then you would enter up into the temple further in. Uh, it's been sealed, of course, for centuries and centuries. But these steps would have been where people like Jesus, rabbis, stop, stand to teach their students as people come in and out of Jerusalem. 
And many times in the Gospels, Jesus is speaking to the crowds in Jerusalem, right? This is one of the spots he would have done that. Most definitely one of the spots where he would have. And so for us, that was really cool. We just stood here for a while uh, and imagined uh, that day. If you turn around, you see a whole bunch of mikvahs right here by the entrance to the Temple Mount. Ceremonial baths that were necessary. The people are going into the temple. They need to be ceremonially clean. They need to have everything in the right order. They need to be ready. And so these ritual baths were here just before they go in so that they could take care of, care of that. And these have been uh, excavated. Again, these would have been inside the city walls in Jesus' day. They're outside now. If you look south from the teaching steps, you can see Bethlehem is right over that hill, six miles that way. Hezekiah's tunnel is right over that way, and so is Caiaphas's house. All of those would have been inside the walls in Jesus' day. They're outside the walls now in the southern section of Jerusalem. It was a hot day. Uh, and just to remind you that, yes, I was there. These are my pictures. Uh, I was wearing my good old mustard seed missions hat uh, that I took with me, and Nicole figured out some other way to keep uh, from getting some heat stroke. Uh, it was a warm day, uh, and that was May, right? Uh, again, in July, in August, it is very hot in Jerusalem. Very hot. So let's take a look at that site from down below. You say we're going up to Jerusalem. If you're going to Jerusalem, you're going up to Jerusalem. For a very good reason. It's up from every direction. <laughs> it's on a hilltop. Uh, and so you've got to go up to get there. And so going back to the, before the time of Christ, when Jews would go to the holy city, to the temple, they would sing the Psalms of Ascent. So named because you sing them as you're climbing up the hills to go to Jerusalem. Psalm 120 to 134. Uh, and no doubt Jesus did so himself and his disciples because everybody did that. Uh, it was quite the thing. Uh, and so you, as you walk up, as you head up these hills, whether you're coming from Bethlehem, whether you're coming from whatever direction you're coming from, you're going up uh, to get into the city, uh, which is, of course, why it was built there. Let me pause for a minute. Any questions? Uh, you can see the different layers of construction, right? The more modern uh, bricks, uh, the smaller stones to the top. Uh, and then, of course, these ones were the steps that Jesus would have walked on because they were there in the time of Herod. Right. Right, when Jesus said, destroy this temple and I'll be rebuild it in three days, they laughed at him because Herod had been working on this for decades before Jesus was born and still was. It was, it was a multi-generational project, a huge amount of labor, right? So, I mean, Herod greatly expanded the temple mount and the temple structure from what was there, rebuilt by Ezra and Nehemiah. All right, so, so it was a massive undertaking of, of expansion uh, and, and making it more grand, more, more, more opulent, uh, which of course Herod did by, by massively raising taxes on the people, which is one of the reasons why he was hated among others. Um, but he poured it into this and into Caesarea Maritima that we saw and to Masada and to other places as well. So uh, aside from being a, a rich guy that, that you know, took a lot of the money for himself, he also poured it into these huge building projects because as a person in the ancient world, he wanted to be remembered. He wanted his family name to be remembered, and it is. We call him Herod the Great, not because he was a great guy, but because he did great things. Right, that's how you get to be called the great in the history books. Uh, it's not because people, you, know, you had high approval ratings. His were horrible, uh, but he did things that lasted until 70 AD when the Romans uh, real showed him that you can destroy quicker than you can build. This on the left is one of those maps that are periodically placed in the city. And I did a smart thing that first day that we went in. I took a picture of it on my phone 
And then when we were wandering around at night uh, as it got dark on the old city, I could zoom in and say, all right, uh, if we want to get back to the Damascus Gate, we need to go two more blocks, then left, then right, then left, and that'll lead us there. Uh, I'm glad I did it because otherwise it gets real confusing when, when you're inside the city and you can't see anything because the, 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 the buildings are on both sides and you lose sight of all the landmarks. Uh, the Wailing Wall is there, the Dung Gate, which is great, sounds great, right? Uh, that's right there. It's a small sort of regular old gate uh, and the pedestrian gate is just to the side of it, but it is the place, the way that you go in if you're an outsider, you don't live in the old city, and you want to go to the Wailing Wall, which means there's a huge checkpoint right inside here with metal detectors and very serious security, right? Uh, for the very obvious reason, because a bomb in this spot would, I don't know, start a regional, perhaps global war, so, you know, they don't want that. This is the Western Wall Plaza uh, that was created after Jerusalem was captured from Jordan during the 1967 Six-Day War. When 1948, when Israel was created by the UN, East Jerusalem was part of that Palestinian state. Because of the war, J Jordan ends up taking over control of it, the neighboring country to the east and they administered Jerusalem until the 67 uh, war in which it was captured by the Israelis uh, and unified, and it's still, of course, part of that controversy. The picture on the bottom left uh, shows you what used to be standing there uh, after uh, it was called the Moroccan Quarter, uh, and it's not super ancient, it's only 800 years old, but it's not there anymore uh, because they said, where, where is the spot for the Jews to come and gather at the wall? It's tiny in this picture. And I said, there's not enough room for all the people that want to come here. So they took a number of buildings and they bulldozed them, which is not all that different from what America did when, in, when we put in the interstate highway system, right? And went through cities and just said, yeah, these blocks we don't need. Uh, and whoever was there, we, we tore them down. It's similar to that. Uh, and so now, you say to yourself, why is this Wailing Wall so important? What's the big deal? It's known as the Wailing Wall in America. Most, most of the rest of uh, the world calls it the Western Wall. It's the well on the western side of the Temple Mount. It's pretty straightforward. Why is, what's the big deal? Why do they have these big explanation plaques as you're walking in to tell you what this is about? The Temple Mount is right on the other side of the wall. And on the Temple Mount is the foundation stone. I didn't take the picture to the right. Obviously, it's black and white. It's, it's an older picture. And you just can't walk into the Dome of the Rock, climb up on the wall, and take a picture. They don't let, that, let you do that. That's the rock in the Dome of the Rock. The rock is the one that traditionally is believed to be the rock upon which Isaac bound Ab or Abraham bound Isaac. The same rock uh, where David offered sacrifices. The same rock where when they built the temple of Solomon and they built the Holy of Holies and placed the Ark of the Covenant, the rock was right underneath the Ark of the Covenant. So, an important spot. Uh, also, uh, in Jewish Talmud, which is the commentary of the rabbis, in Jewish Talmud, it says that this same rock is the one from which God created the world. He created this rock and then he used that material to make the world. I don't know where they got that idea from, but that's, you know, that's a big deal. Uh, that it's also where Abraham, Abel, and Noah offered sacrifices. Again, it's in Talmud, I don't know. And it's the rock upon which Jacob fell asleep when he saw the stairway to heaven. So yeah, it's important. This is the spot where they believe the Holy of Holies was in the Temple of Solomon. Now it is the Muslim mosque known as the Dome of the Rock because Muslims believe that Muhammad stood on this rock and then ascended into heaven. So yeah, an important spot and it's right on the other side of this wall. So when you're in this space, you are as close to that sacred spot as any Jew has been since who knows when, right? Now, 
for much of its history, the Temple Mount was abandoned after the Romans destroyed what was on there. The Christians didn't build a church on the Temple Mount because it wasn't sacred to them. They built it at the site of the crucifixion, at the site of the, the, the tomb. That's what they cared about. They didn't care about the Temple Mount, uh, so it was basically left empty uh, for centuries, and then eventually, of course, the Muslims built the, uh, on top of, of it. This place of prayer is 187 feet wide now, after they, they, they cleared out the space. Only 187 feet wide. The whole wall, is, it's a rectangle, is 1,600 feet long. And that is the retaining wall, of the foundation upon which Herod built his temple additions. Notice, what do you notice in this picture? What jumps out at you? Right in the middle of, uh, to the right-hand side of the picture. Bisecting it. Why is there a fence running right down the middle of this picture uh, from the back to the front? And there's people on both sides. Nope, no, nope, no Muslims here. Uh, these are Orthodox Jews. Uh, do not let the women and the, and the men worship together. Women on the right, men on the left. Uh, you both get to go up to the Wailing Wall, but we're not standing next to each other. It's a thing, uh, and so that's, uh, that's the rule. Uh, and when our group got there, the women in our group went to the right, the men in our group went to the left. Uh, you are allowed, as a non-Jew, to go visit the Wailing Wall. Uh, as a man, they have a little, a, little, a little stand as you're walking up with little uh, disposable paper uh, kippahs uh, to put on your head uh, to show respect, uh, and you just walk up and you go in. Now, it's not polite to take pictures of people praying uh, or, or take pictures while you're up there. I didn't take any pictures. Again, I saw other people taking pictures, but I was like, no. Uh, so this is why I took this picture back here. You can see all of these tables and chairs, right? There is a tremendous amount of books and studying happening here. There are Jews that come here all the time, sit in front of the wall, open up their, their Hebrew scriptures and pray and read the scriptures, and they're, they're there for hours and hours, uh, men and women. Uh, that do this in this space, praying for the return uh, for the Messiah to come and reestablish the temple and yada yada, all of that kind of thing. Um, so let's look at the wall itself. The first seven layers are from the period of Jesus, Herod's temple, the bottom seven. You can see they're, they're older, they're bigger, See the middle section? That is from the 8th century, from the Umayyad dynasty. Smaller stones, not, right, this is an interesting commentary on human history. The bigger, more impressive stones are on the bottom, and then you get medium-sized ones, and then the 16th century ones on top by the Ottomans, they look kind of pathetic by comparison, right? To those huge, Nice ones on the bottom. Of course, there's some moss and whatnot growing uh, in the cracks, but it's been here a long time. The cracks are what you've seen people utilize, right? What do people do in the cracks? Put a prayer. I did. Most of the people in our group did. We, we got out a piece of paper. You write something on there. Uh, obviously, someone comes through and takes those out because if people are putting them in the cracks every single day, all the cracks are going to be full real quick. I don't know what happens to them. I don't know if they're, you know, shredded or recycled or who knows what. But uh, uh, so we were able to go in. We walked up. We stood there for a while. Uh, it's a kind of place where you don't feel like saying anything. You just feel like standing there. Uh, and soaking it in, uh, and that's certainly something that we did. Uh, I already mentioned the, the women on the right, the men on the left. You see the Dome of the Rock? That's how close it is. That's not far. It's right on the other side of the wall. Uh, a, a number of feet, I don't know, what are we, 60, 70 feet from where that rock is, uh, which of course is why it's uh, such a sacred spot. You see that little arch to the left? Uh, that little entrance way. There is now, and we weren't able to go in it, there is now a tunnel 
that has been excavated that runs from here all the way to the top of, uh, all the way to the end of the western wall and comes out on the other end. Uh, it's a modern excavation that was done for traffic for the Israelis. They wanted people to be able to get to move around this area easier, and so they have a new entrance so that you can come down to the Wailing Wall from the north. When they opened that entrance in the Muslim quarter, there was a riot, and 80 people were killed. Because, and here's the thing, the Muslims thought what you're actually going to do is dig under the Temple Mount and be up to something. And that has always been a, a, a fear in the modern era that the Christian uh, excavators, that the Israeli excavators would dig under the Temple Mount to try to find Solomon's riches, who knows what, right? The, Ar the Ark of the Covenant, uh, uh, you know, we already know where Indiana Jones put it, but I mean, still. So, but that is the kind of thing that will get people killed. Uh, and so there is a, a now a, a, a system that, that runs along that you can go from here all the way to the north uh, if you have, you know, uh, access to it. Uh, it's, it. You can look up the pictures of it. It's quite, it's quite fascinating. Um, d d d one more. Uh, I already talked about the tables uh, and the picture taking uh, and the time that we spent there. But uh, you can see there was a good crowd, 90%. Jewish men on the left there, uh, just praying, Mo many of them Orthodox, uh, from various sects, you can tell from the, the way they're dressed and the way their hair is, that they're from different groups. Um, and then of course, the, the occasional uh, Christian pilgrims wanting to come here as well uh, and, and visiting the site. Questions about the wall? Well, they can go into the Dome of the Rock. They can go on the Temple Mount. Uh, there's two mosques on the temple. Uh, uh, there's one on the bottom left corner uh, of the Temple Mount, and then there's the Dome of the Rock. So, so they have two places to visit right there. Uh, so this, this spot's not really sacred to them. Uh, the, one, the only one that's associated with Muhammad is up on the top. Um, and, and you will hear from time to time someone say, well, we should just demolish the Dome of the Rock uh, and, and rebuild, right? There are some ultra-Orthodox uh, Zionist Jews who would love to do that, who would love to dynamite the Dome of the Rock and start rebuilding the temple. But of course, that would be World War III. All right, because there's, there's about two billion people in the world that would, d that would want war uh, over that. Uh, so it ain't gonna happen unless somebody Right, somebody, uh, but the Israeli government stops that kind of stuff, nonsense from happening because they don't want World War III. Uh, they don't want, you know, because that would be bad uh, for everybody involved. But I mean, that, every once in a while you'll hear, after 9-11 I heard some people saying, oh, we should just, we should just nuke Mecca. And you're just like, <laughs> what are you thinking, right? And that's the same kind of, Again, it only takes a couple of people to start a war, right? Uh, and so that security on the Temple Mount is a serious thing uh, because there have been riots. Uh, during the Intifada, if you go back a generation, uh, young Palestinian men were throwing rocks from up there down onto the, the Jews here at the Wailing Wall because they were in the middle of an uprising. Uh, so violence has happened here before. Uh, in this spot. So far, there haven't, there's only been one incident uh, since the war started in October. They had two brothers that shot up a bus station in East Jerusalem. Um, that's the only one that I've seen in the news, uh, but you can imagine that, that it's a much tenser place than it was. We walked the city, uh, and, and I'll mention this now because I'm on this. You, you, you don't know who's Jewish, who's Muslim, and who's Christian. Nobody cares. And that's what our guide said. We, we live next to Muslims, we live next to Jews, nobody cares, all right? Except for the zealots who want to start a war. Nobody else, everyone else is just trying to live their lives. Uh, we're all just trying to make a living, we're trying to feed our families, nobody cares. Uh, people from the outside care more uh, because they don't have to live there, right? You can, you can agitate and, and, and poke when you're not living there. Uh, but it's not really what happens in, in, for, in most people's lives. We are in good shape because we are at Hezekiah's Tunnels. 
who, who's claustrophobic? You don't like caves, you don't like tunnels. Anyone? So you, you all would go in Hezekiah's tunnel, huh? Because that's the entrance. And as we were going, there were a whole bunch of school kids, second graders, third graders, fourth graders. It's three, uh, th here's the text from Second Chronicles 32:30. It was Hezekiah who blocked the upper outlet of the Gihon Spring and channeled the water down to the west side of the city of David. Again, just like that water tunnel in Megiddo, you need to protect your water source in an ancient city. And so there was a fortress, there was a tower built ab around the spring to protect it, and then a tunnel to make sure that that water got safely into the city. And we walked through it. You go down this long set of stairs, you down, down, down underground, and you realize you are now in a third, a third of a mile long tunnel that drops 12 inches because it's got to let the water flow. Uh, it was usually about uh, a foot deep, cold water, because it's spring water. Uh, a couple times it was up to the bottom of our shorts. Uh, and it's about that same size the whole way. It's, of course, 100% dark, so either a flashlight or your cell phone. And, of course, as I told, uh, we just covered this on Sunday morning. I've been doing uh, a little short segment of this trip every Sunday since I got back. If you're going to hold your cell phone up as your light, hold on to it good. Because if you drop it, it's done. Because it's wet everywhere. Uh, this, 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 is, this spring still flows and the water still goes through here. Now it's a tourist destination. Uh, and little kids in Israel, they walk through it uh, just like kids here go wherever they go uh, for, for something cool uh, to see. Go to the Statue of Liberty, go to, go to wherever. Uh, they go through Hezekiah's tunnel. Uh, I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, they went from both sides. You can see that a, at a couple times they were like a little more left because it, it turns. You can tell that they made an adjustment uh, there's different theories about how they knew whether or not they were on, on course, right? Maybe they were doing something up above, you know, banging on the ground and trying to hear where they were supposed to go. Who knows? But they did find each other and finished the tunnel, uh, and this brought water safely into the city uh, during the time of Hezekiah. At its other end, uh, away from the city, uh, excuse me, at its end closer, this would have been inside the city back in the day, you have the Pool of Siloam. Uh, this is an ongoing excavation. It's not ready to be seen. They only rediscovered this site in 2004. They must have been doing some other work, and lo and behold, there it is. This would have been a place uh, for, you know, public uh, comfort. It's a hot city. Uh, a spring-fed pool has got to be a, uh, uh, quite the treat a place to go get cooled off, uh, along with all the ritual mikvahs in, in the city, but this is uh, another such place. Uh, you can see the tour bus on the far side of it. Uh, so when you come out the tunnel, there it is, uh, and eventually you'll be able to go. They'll, they'll dig that further down in and, and, and uncover the old pool. Um, questions on Hezekiah's tunnel. That's also one of those bucket list things that everyone's like, oh, I wanna go through Hezekiah's tunnel. It was fairly cool. It's a long walk. A third of the mile in a foot deep water that you're sloshing through uh, in the dark is uh, quite the thing. Oh yeah, I mean, that, that's solid rock that they, that they chiseled through. Uh, that, that is the bedrock that, on which Jerusalem is built. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was fun. All right, we made it to the last thing that I wanted to make sure we made it to, and we only got 10 minutes, so we are in great shape. Um, this is the church of St. Anne, the mother of Mary, in the old city in Jerusalem. Uh, it was built in 1131 through 1138, so it's a crusader church. Uh, the, when the kingdom of Jerusalem, the crusader kingdom of Jerusalem, ruled this area for a, a period, for a generation and a half or so before Saladin reconquered the city, they built this. It was over the ruins of a Byzantine basilica, which had been built next to the pools of Bethesda. Uh, and those are fascinating. We'll look at those next. There's a beautiful garden outside. It's an amazingly acoustically pure church. You go inside and, and, and just the, the echoes are, are so good. And I know that, whoops, Sorry, didn't mean to do that. 
go to the next slide. I know that because my wife sang. <laughs> you can see she smiled. Anybody catch what that was? The speaker on our data projector is, is, is junk compared to what it sounds like there. That was my wife singing Ave Maria in Latin. Uh, she wasn't going to do it, but the priest walked up to her and said, you look like you want to sing. Go ahead and do it. Uh, and she did. Our whole group had sung a song, and of course, we're not, uh, we're not harmonizing very well. It still sounded beautiful. Uh, professional choirs come in here all the time and perform uh, and, and stand in a circle and sing, and it just sounds amazing. You can see some awesome YouTube videos of that if you want. Uh, and then she did that. It was like a, like a, a highlight of the trip for my, my wife. Uh, go to the next one. There we go. Whoops, whoops. The Pool of Bethesda, John 5. Chapter 2, or verses 2 and 8. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. And then skipping ahead, Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. The story of the man that was waiting there by the pool, because legend had it that an angel would stir the waters and the first one in would get healed. We have no idea if that's a true story or not, but the people believed it, so that they gathered there, and this man's like, I'm paralyzed. How am I ever going to be the first one in? And Jesus said, yeah, I got a deal for you. It's an easier way. And so they excavated these pools. And you can see pools go down into the, into the ground a little bit anyway, but you can see how much lower from the modern city of Jerusalem these pools are today. Uh, and that work of excavation has largely been done. I took a picture over the side. I mean, that's like a good 40 feet down from where we were standing to get to the bottom of those pools. So again, this is a spot that we know down lower, where, where he stood, Jesus was here. And he healed a man who was waiting to get into this pool and said, get up, take your mat, and go. He said that because it was a Sabbath, and he wanted to challenge them because carrying your mat on the Sabbath was work, and he knew they would be upset. And he did it anyway because he wanted to challenge their understanding of why the Sabbath exists uh, and what the, the need of doing righteous on a day of rest, righteousness. So it's a, it's a beautiful story in John, uh, and it took place here uh, in this spot, of course, uh, that has been excavated right next to St. Anne's Church. They knew it was there, of course, because the church was built on the site of the monastery that was built next to where those pools were. Uh, so it was just a matter of looking. We're a little bit ahead of schedule, but I'd rather... Uh, use this time wisely in case next week I get slowed down at some point. There's only a couple more spots in Jerusalem. This is the tomb of King David, uh, probably not the actual resting place of David. Uh, it occupies the ground floor of a former church whose upper story is the traditional site of the upper room. The cenotaph that's this memorial empty tomb. Some, sometimes uh, like the tomb of this person or the tomb of that person, we know they're not in there, but because they're such a famous person, we want to have a tomb for people to visit. That's what this is. The Crusaders built this, uh, and people come here, again, 
to, to, to pray and to read uh, probably the Psalms of David and whatnot. Uh, and there's a women's side and a men's side uh, of it as well. Uh, we just walked in. Uh, you, there's really nothing to see. It's covered by, a, by, a, by this fabric here. Uh, and of course, the Crusaders built it. So obviously, David is not in there. Nobody knows what happened to his bones. Uh, but it's a, a spot for people, right, that, that want to see the, the return of, of a Davidic kingdom. Uh, for them to come and pray. Uh, and then upstairs is a church uh, that was built by the Crusaders on the spot that they believed uh, the Last Supper was held. We don't know. The text doesn't tell us where in the city they found that room, right? Simply that Jesus said, uh, they will show you a large room upstairs all furnished and we'll eat there. It obviously didn't look like this. This is a Crusader era church, not a, not a residential home, uh, but uh, again, we're on the southern side of the city, outside the city walls today, inside the city walls then. And I will stop there because after that we go to the Mount of Olives uh, and look at the site uh, of, of Jesus' passion there, uh, and we will look at that, and then we're going to go into, this, into uh, Masada and Qumran and the Dead Sea uh, and finish up that with those. Any questions? Because uh, the, the rest of the stuff I have is outside of the city uh, on, the th in, uh, on that hill, so we'll save that for next week. Questions at this point? Yes, Samantha. Uh, well, the city wasn't fought over in that respect. World War II, it wasn't fought over at all because, uh, because the Germans, uh, they invaded Egypt from the west, but they didn't conquer Egypt, so they never got near, near uh, Palestine. It was under British control at the time. Uh, during World War I, there was fighting, on, you know, like under Lawrence of Arabia and whatnot, but not over the city. Uh, there was fighting in the city, in the old city in 1967. Uh, you, you can see video, they have movie footage, you know, video footage of soldiers running around these city streets and, and, with, and so there was some damage from that. Uh, but it wasn't as if either side was going to shoot artillery or something or drop bombs from planes on the old city because that's just a bad idea. So uh, in that sense, it, it, the, it, it has survived the modern era fairly well, um, uh, all things considered, uh, <laughs> in, 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 the, in such a tumultuous place as this is. Other questions, other thoughts? Right. So, so, right. So there are underground structures all over the old city that, that have yet to be excavated. Uh, any, any excavation is fraught with danger of, of making people upset, uh, and you have to be extremely careful because you don't know what's there and who, who it belongs to and what air it's from and all of that sort of thing. Actually, there is some more stuff inside the city I forgot. From here on out, we, we, we're going to go walk through the Passion, uh, starting with uh, with the Mount of Olives and, uh, and then going through uh, the, the, um, the Garden of Gethsemane and then into the uh, Via Dolorosa and look at all 12 steps. I forgot, I haven't done that part yet. Uh, and then after that, we will leave Jerusalem and go to the south, uh, to the east from here. Um, but, but certainly, uh, there, there is so much left to uncover because the modern city is built on top of the old one. Um, and that has long been a, a contention. Where were the walls of, of this? Where was this? Where was that in the time of David, in the time of Herod? Uh, and it's not easy. One of the things, and I haven't mentioned this yet, one of the things that confounds historians is that they'll find a stone in a mosque that has a crusader symbol on it that used to belong to a Byzantine church that before that was part of a first century synagogue or whatever. It's been in five different buildings each time, you know, when it was destroyed, when, when something was knocked down, they were like, this is a good stone. We can reuse this one. And so it ends up a mile away from where it originally, you know, was in a building that is nothing to do with its original uh, site. Uh, and that can make things very difficult to determine uh, what's going on in a site because 
just because we're, we're rebuilding doesn't mean we're not going to use all the stones that are still useful, right? I mean, quarrying stones is a lot of work. So any stone that was reusable got reused, and they get reshuffled into new buildings down through the eras. Uh, and that, that happens to this, to this, or will happen until the modern era. Uh, and so a lot, of this, a lot of these buildings in the old city that are from the Ottoman era or the, the you know, pre-modern era there, some of those stones go back to the time of David, or not time of David, time of Jesus, but they're not where they, the buildings they used to be in, uh, of course, because those aren't standing anymore. There's almost nothing from the time of Jesus that's as it was. Again, the Temple Mount, the, the structure, that's the same because it wasn't destroyed by the Romans. Uh, and then some of the walls were incorporated into the, modern, to the Ottomans' walls. Uh, and that's, of course, what, uh, what historians and excavators and archaeologists are trying to determine, right? This particular ruin that we just uncovered, which era does it belong to? What building did it used to be? There was a massive Byzantine-era church uh, in the 400s and the 500s that, that, that was destroyed later. Uh, and, and just recently, just uh, next to the Dung Gate, they found the foundations of that, of that church. It was a huge basilica. Now, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is still there. This church disappeared. And until, until modern archaeologists found it recently, nobody even knew exactly where it was. They knew it was here because we have stories of pilgrims visiting it that have survived, and they described where it was located, they described what it looked like, but nobody had ever been able to find the spot. And they found that, that the modern walls, the 16th century walls, uh, bisect it. So like the church sits, the old site sits uh, across where the wall is today. Uh, it's just a fascinating mishmash of stuff like that uh, that you just don't get in the Western Hemisphere, right? Uh, when, when Chicago burned down, the, you know, they, they started over. They, no, nobody, you know, they, we didn't build on top and, and, and it's not preserved there anymore uh, like that. So any closing questions or thoughts? Our time is up. I appreciate you coming. We've got the home stretch next week, the rest of Jerusalem, and then, of course, uh, the desert around the Dead Sea. Oh, you are welcome.